Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday evening prayer service. Let's kick things off. Stand together. Sing with me. We're marching to Zion. Come with and love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus surround the throne and thus surround the throne. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. But children Children of the heavenly king, they speak of their joys abroad, they speak their joys abroad. Oh, we're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. On the third now, the hill of Zion. A thousand sacred streets Before we reach the heavenly fields Before we reach the heavenly fields Or walk the golden streets Or walk the golden streets Sing out! We're marching to Zion Beautiful, beautiful Zion We're marching upward to Then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's crown. We're marching through Emmanuel's crown to fairer worlds on high. To fairer worlds on high. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Amen. Amen. Welcome. I'm so glad you're here tonight. Uh, we've much to thank the Lord for as we approach the Thanksgiving season next week. Remember our midweek service next week will be on Tuesday night at 6.30. So plan to be here this coming Sunday. is going to be a wonderful day. We'll have uh, communion, the Lord's Supper. We'll gather around the table of the Lord uh, in the Word of God, and we'll participate uh, together uh, in taking of the Lord's Supper on Sunday morning. And that will take place during the message. I will bring a message uh, with uh, the supper. And uh, I believe the Lord will use that in a powerful way as we give thanks to God for the gift of the Lord Jesus, his precious body that was broken, his blood that was shed on our behalf. And then Sunday night at 5.30, you don't want to miss, you want to be here on time, uh, the Primitive Quartet will be with us at 5.30 Sunday evening. And I know a lot of people are excited about it. I am as well. And then our church family will gather uh, after that, next door for uh, a time of soup and bread and desserts and little finger things, whatever you bring, uh, I'll try to eat it. And uh, I, I usually don't have a problem with that. Uh, my problem is I, I have to buy clothes that wrap around me, but I'm so short they drag the ground under me. So I don't know. Y'all just pray for me. It's a good thing uh, to be well fed. Amen. You could be starving to death somewhere tonight. But uh, we're warm and fed and blessed, and God is so amazingly gracious to us. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we love you, we praise you, and thank you for our Wednesday night prayer meeting and Bible study. Lord, we look to you. We need a word from you tonight, from your word. And I pray that you'll bless us as we have gathered together to share and to bear in the things uh, of our lives that bring us concern 
And Lord, I pray that as we bring these things one to another, that in unity we'll all bring them to you because you already know and you already care and you're touched with the very feeling of every infirmity. And for God's grace and mercy to be shown uh, through uh, even suffering and sickness is a marvelous thing because it brings stability and strength to the body of Christ. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help us tonight to be strengthened by your word. I pray for the Awana ministry and all that is taking place in the various Awana clubs tonight. I pray, Father, that you will bless it, use it uh, to draw in for the kingdom those that should be saved. Lord, thank you for each person who has faithfully come tonight. Uh, Lord, speak to their hearts. Give them, Lord, something that they can take home. And uh, Father, it will hold them uh, in place. It will give them peace. Uh, Lord, it will bring them uh, the persuasion to continue on. And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As you remain standing, let's sing together. There shall be showers of blessings. There shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing. Sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing. Showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling. But for the showers we Showers of blessing, precious reviving again. Over the hills and the valleys, sound of abundance of rain. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we the third that's good singing there shall be showers of blessing send them upon us O Lord grant to us now a refreshing come and now honor thy word showers of blessing showers of blessing we need mercy drops round us are fall Hours we bleed. Now on that last verse, there shall be showers of blessing. Oh, that today they might fall. Now as to God we're confessing. Now as on Jesus we call. Showers of blessing. Showers of blessing we need. Around us are falling, but for the showers we plead. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. You know, I'm thankful tonight that no matter what we're facing and what trials we may be going through, that we're held in the palm of his hand. I love this old song. You listen to the message in it, Till the Storm Passes By. Of the midnight have I oft in my face While the storms howl above me And there's no hiding place Mid the crash of the thunder Precious Lord, hear my cry 
me safe till the storm passes by. Till the storm passes over. Till the thunder sounds no more. Till the clouds roll forever from the sky Hold me fast Let me stand In the hollow of your hand Keep me safe Till the storm passes This verse. Now many times Satan whispers, there is no need to try, for there's no end to sorrow, there's no hope by and by. Oh, but I know thou art with me. And tomorrow I'll rise where the storm and never darkens the sky till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more. Till the clouds they roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of your hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. Yes, hold me fast and let me stand in the hollow of your hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. Thank you, Brother Boone. What a blessing. The storm comes and it goes, and the Lord holds us safely within the veil. We're in the secret place of the Most High God. Amen. What a blessing to know that He will hold me fast. You know, I enjoy listening to a man sing with passion. You know, there have been times I've been standing in church with my wife and I'll be singing, maybe I'm a little louder than she thinks it should be and kind of elbows me. You don't have to sing so loud. I look at her and say, Daddy told me that real men sing. Now I'll tell you, I preached a men's conference on Friday night of last week and two times Saturday morning. And uh, that band of merry men, they sang. They really sang. Now, when I got there, I was a little bit shocked because um, a lot of the guys there had a hoodie on and they had their head shaved. And I had to ask them if we were uh, having a Fetterman uh, rally. <laughs> Some of you will catch that in a minute. <laughs> but they chuckled real good. They thought that was funny. Anyway, we're going to be turning our Bibles to the first and second chapter of the book of Jeremiah tonight. And as you prepare to receive the word, let me encourage you uh, to reach out this week to Miss Grace Wellman. Grace is a precious lady who loves our church and um, was and has been and is today a faithful prayer warrior for this church. 
and she loves everybody, though she be the meanest woman in the church. Our Samaritan's shoebox uh, ministry, uh, tonight we need those boxes. Hopefully you have brought them to the Welcome Center, and uh, we would encourage you, if you have not, to please bring them this Sunday, this Sunday, November the 20th, and that will really help us to uh, stay ahead of the game in terms of getting those packages to the destination uh, that we need to get them to. We do want to extend our love and sympathy to Miss Judy Ray and the passing of her husband, Frank Ray, and we just continue to lift them up in prayer. We will have a deacon's meeting following the service tonight. There is a men's ministry breakfast this Saturday, and I encourage you to come. Our speaker is Brother Ken uh, Falkenberry, and uh, I believe you'll be blessed if you come Saturday morning. Uh, we are in the midst of our gift card extravaganza, and uh, this week I have enjoyed, uh, even up into the very start of our service tonight, uh, allowing the blessing of God's people to touch the hearts of many of our dear folk here. And so thank you, those of you that have been a part of that, thank you, and we continue to receive those cards, and we'll uh, make sure that they are uh, handed out appropriately uh, as uh, the need is before us uh, throughout the uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas season. Our amazing grays have activities coming up, and uh, I would just ask that you uh, pray for uh, Brother Bruce and Miss Phyllis. She is recovering from knee replacement surgery. Uh, felt like she had somewhat of an infection, and uh, they were trying to get her back to the doctor today, if I understood that just right. So remember these upcoming events that uh, Brother Bruce and Miss Phyllis uh, lead in, and they do a wonderful job. On the back of your bulletin tonight, of course, is the extensive list of those uh, that are shut in. We pray for Mabel Shepherd at Cleveland Pines, Wilma Johnson at Fair Haven Nursing Home, Joyce Morgan over in Shelby Manor, and, that it, and then at White Oak Manor uh, here in Shelby, we have Betty Ellis, Virginia Marlowe, uh, Jerry Tessonier, and Norma Lambert. At White Oak Manor in Kings Mountain, Miss Mary Ann Green. Uh, at home, uh, shut in is Juanita Biggerstaff, with Charles and Sue Boone, Becky Bumgardner, Dolores Church, David Ellis, Peggy Gant, Tommy Horton, Bernie Jones, Richard McSwain, Ann Mode, Nell Oliver, Sandra Stroud, Betty Tolbert, and Grace Wellman. Remember to pray for our staff uh, at the rehab, uh, the VA rehab in Asheville, Richard McSwain. Uh, Charlotte rehab is Don Bell. I saw him today, and he has improved over these last uh, several days. So continue to pray for Don. Uh, pray for him physically. Pray for him uh, emotionally. This is a tough fight, and uh, chemotherapy can make one uh, just tragically ill. So please uh, be in prayer uh, for uh, Brother Don. Uh, Mildred Blanton has an upcoming surgery uh, on the 22nd. Pray for her. And then resting, recouping, recovering at home. Uh, Brother Randy Allen. Uh, Brother Randy, I got some news today from the doctor that's not uh, the best of news. So please pray for Brother Randy Allen. Pray that the Lord will touch him and meet the need of his life. Continue to pray for Mike Austin, for Ben Barcliffe, for Mildred Blanton, Scott Carpenter, Barbara Clemens, James Duncan, Phyllis Aker, Bill, and Becky Ewing. Becky Ewing, fighting cancer. Sherry Evans, Brother Ken Flowers, Joel and Lois Hendrick, Marie Honeycutt, uh, I believe home from uh, rehab, but still in need of prayers for recovery. Uh, Betty Lemons, Erlene Leonard, Roger and Dorothy Lester, uh, Kim uh, McLeod, fighting cancer, Billy Miller, fighting cancer, Joan Moore, uh, overcoming cancer, 
Uh, Jeanette Patterson, we continue to pray for her. Uh, Shirley Pearson, still trying to recover from her bout with pneumonia. Please pray for her. Uh, Lacey Perel, uh, Gail Randall, uh, Steve Reynolds, Joe and Jerika Spangler, uh, Steve Swagger. I had lunch with he and his wife yesterday. Uh, Steve and Brenda took it to their home, and uh, he is still suffering uh, with uh, the problems of his back and then the blood disease that he has. So pray for them. Tony and Linda West, Rose Witt, uh, Michelle Wilson, Brother Steve Wright. And then I would ask you tonight uh, to pray for Linda Rayfield and for her family. Linda Rayfield uh, is nearing home. And uh, don't know if it's in hours or days, but I, I can tell you she is nearing home. She's uh, ready to cross over. Uh, she's prepared. And uh, that is the promise that awaits her. And uh, she truly, pleasantly welcomes it. Welcomes the uh, opportunity to see her Lord and Savior, to be reunited with loved ones that have gone on before. So you pray uh, for her family and pray that uh, through all of this sickness and suffering that somehow family members and friends' eyes can be turned to Jesus. And that's what we need to pray for. And uh, I tell you what, I believe that Linda Rayfield would believe that every moment of her illness would be worth it all if friends and family members would come to saving faith. So you pray for that, if you will, tonight. Um, I would ask that you pray for Sunday. You know, coming to the Lord's table is a solemn, sacred, and serious event for the people of God. It ought to be joyful, absolutely joyful, and a wonderful experience when God's people come to the table. But it is an opportunity for us to examine ourselves and to make our hearts right, our hearts clean. Mama didn't let us come to the table with dirty hands. And uh, the Lord doesn't want you coming to his table with a dirty heart. And so it's an opportunity for God's people really to just surrender themselves more to the Lord Jesus, to be uh, filled with less of themselves and filled more with him. And let's pray that God will use that service to point lost people that will be here. And I assure you, we will have lost people here Sunday morning that through that service, we'll point people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so pray for that. Pray for the Sunday evening service. I believe it's going to be such a blessing. And uh, I believe the Lord will really minister to us uh, through the primitive quartet and through the word of God. So you come anticipating those things. Invite people to come and be a part. And we'll have a wonderful day on Sunday. We have baptism Sunday, so uh, there'll be uh, some good things happening Sunday. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the privilege of prayer and for a place of prayer. This is a house of prayer. And we are the people of prayer. We come with our hearts joined together, our minds in one accord, our faith, Lord, we have laid hold to it. And we believe that you're able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can even think to ask. Lord, you know. You know the needs that we have mentioned tonight. You knew them before we ever got here. But Lord, that your people care, that your people commune with you about these things, touches your very heart. And Father, I pray that as we come to you tonight boldly to the throne of grace in a time of need, that, Lord, your mercies would be experienced, that your grace would be extended, that your help would be secured. For, Lord, you said, call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things thou knowest not. Lord, there are many things that we have not because we ask not. And so tonight, Father, we pray for a fresh anointing. God, for a moving of the Spirit of God in this place upon these people and those that, Lord, we love and care about 
and are lifting up to you tonight. Lord, I pray specifically tonight for those that are battling cancer. Lord, even for those whose fight is just near over, I pray, God, for your grace. I pray, God, for visions of rapture and endless glories unveiled before their eyes. And that, God, you would give peace that passes understanding. That the spirit of the living God would hover close and that as he hovers, Lord, that there would be a sense of persuasion that we ought to look to Christ, that we ought to lean upon Christ, that we ought to learn of Christ. Oh, Father, how I pray that you would be glorified. Lord, if we must suffer loss and heaven must take gain, then Lord, I pray that uh, you'd whisper sweet peace. That Lord, your very presence would become so very precious and so very real. Lord, I pray for the salvation of souls. I pray, Father, that you'll work in our upcoming Lord's Day and all the events of this coming Sunday, Father, that Jesus might be lifted high, that he might be seen at the table, and that, Lord, he might be heard in every chair. Lord, how I pray that you'd bless the Awana ministry tonight, Bless our faithful missionaries. Bless our faithful evangelists. I pray for the works of uh, the Crossroad Rescue Mission and the Pregnancy Resource Center and the Abuse Prevention Council and uh, the many local endeavors, Lord, that we pray for and support. I pray, Father, for the Brazil ministry and I pray tonight for the Dominican ministry. Lord, that you would just give souls, that you would supply, and that, Lord, you would just strengthen your servants that go in your name, speak in your name. Lord, I pray for those families that uh, are in need this time of year. They're struggling. Lord, I pray that you would just Meet their every need according to your riches in Christ Jesus. Lord, we're so thankful that you use this church to be a gathering place, a giving people, and a going people. Lord, find us faithful. May we shine brightly where we are planted. God, may the extension of this place reach far and wide. And Lord, we'll give you praise and honor for all that you accomplish in the surrender and the submission and the service of your people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In Jeremiah chapter number one and chapter number two, we find the beginning of Jeremiah's ministry, a ministry that would at times be very difficult. At times it would be discouraging. At times his ministry would be dry. There there weren't overflooded altars and uh, positive responses toward God and toward God's Word. But Jeremiah had a passion within him known as the Word of God. And even when discouraged and deciding that it's useless to carry on, that it's useless to communicate these things because people refused to hear. 
And people reject what they hear. And people reproach those that speak what they need to hear. Even when Jeremiah was in that place, there was a fire burning within him that he could not quench, that he could not drown out. It was shut up in his bones. God had so purpose that he would be, he would be ordained as a voice among the people. In a terrible time, he would find that he could do no other. Sort of like Martin Luther, when he nailed his multi-point thesis to the wall there in Germany, he said, here I stand, I can do no other. Our times that we live in presently call for people with that resolve. Here I stand, I can do no other. I can speak none other. When we come into the first chapter, you'll notice over and over again that God is speaking. Look in verse number two. The word of the Lord came. Verse number four, then the word of the Lord came. And verse number seven, but the Lord said unto me, Verse number nine, and the Lord said unto me. Verse number 11, moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me. Verse number 12, then said the Lord unto me. Verse number 13, and the word of the Lord came unto me. Verse number 14, then the Lord said unto me. Over and over again in chapter 1, Jeremiah is giving his attention to the voice of God. He is giving his attention to what saith the Lord. Now he's not to bottle that up. He's not to hold it inside. But rather he's being called upon to share a message. Not his own message. Not his own words. But the word of the Lord. We come to chapter number two. And God brings a, a message. And it's the first message that God gives to backslidden Judah through this faithful prophet. There were times he was feeble. There were times he was frail. There were times he thought he was finished, but he was faithful. He was faithful to speak what the Lord said. We're living in a spiritual climate where men are afraid to speak and to say what God has said. I mean, that's where we are. That's where we are. And there is a great temptation upon the man of God to kind of refrain, to somewhat take a step back, maybe to reset, maybe to rethink, Maybe to reevaluate how and what he says. But God has not called us to do anything less than to preach the word. And the word of God. Everyone in this room tonight is a proclaimer. Everyone in this room tonight is a preacher. Uh, both male and female, you prophesy. You bring a word. You are living epistles. You live out the word. And you and I are to speak out the word in the various places and positions and the people that God brings us to. It's required in stewards that they be found faithful. 
that they not be weary in well-doing, knowing that in due season they shall reap if they faint not. You and I have been called to faithfulness and we've been called to finish well. We've been called to fight a fight of faith and to contend for the very faith once and for all delivered to the saints of the first century, the church. The ecclesia, the called out, is not the blended in. We are the called out. We are separated. We are peculiar. We are zealous of good works. And we have a message from our king. And that message ought to come from us faithfully. Faithfully. And in fullness of what God has said. When we come to chapter 2, after God has been speaking, speaking, speaking into the heart of this prophet ordained from the womb, <laughs> ordained a preacher to the nations and specifically to Judah. We find moreover the word of the Lord came to me saying, go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem saying, thus saith the Lord, I remember thee the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness in a land that was not sown. Israel was holiness unto the Lord, and the first fruits of his increase, all that devour him shall offend evil, shall come upon them, saith the Lord. Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me and have walked after vanity and are become vain? Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought, and of the shadows of death through a land that no man passed through and where no man dwelt. And I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when ye entered, ye defiled my land and made mine heritage an abomination. The priest said not, where is the Lord? And they that handle the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me. And the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. Wherefore, I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord. And with your children's children will I plead. For pass over the isles of Chittim and see and send unto Kedar. And consider diligently and see if there be such a thing. Hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, saith the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. The prophet is bringing the first message to backslidden Judah. And he is simply giving them three things from the Lord. The Lord through Jeremiah reminds Israel of the days of blessing and deliverance. And you say, well, how does that equate to us, Pastor? Just a little over two centuries ago, God brought some God-fearing people across the ocean to the eastern side of the ocean. Allow them to land there at Plymouth Rock and to begin colonies and communities 
that were Bible-believing, Bible-behaving, Christ-honoring communities. Rhode Island was, was one of those early places. It began as a, a Baptist colony. Imagine that. And those people had fled from England to get out from under the oppression of the King of England and the Church of England. They wanted to worship God according to the moving of the Spirit of God and their conscious awareness of what God's Word said. And, and they, they believed and they stated with their dying breath in the Revolutionary War that came uh, some decades later, we have no king but Jesus. That's our history. That's our history that is being rewritten and buried beneath the rubble of lies. This nation was founded upon Judeo-Christian ethic. Our elementary school children were taught out of the New England primer and uh, when they learned the alphabet, every letter of the alphabet began with something that would point them to God. God is reminding through Jeremiah He's reminding the people of Judah from whence they came. He said, remember out there in the wilderness when you didn't have any of this? When you didn't have these walled cities, these houses that you didn't build, these vineyards that you didn't uh, plant? Do, do you remember how you, you, you longed after me and you looked to me? Our nation is so far so far down the road from where we began. And I know this isn't a July 4th or what have you, but I'm just sharing with you tonight, we're, we're in trouble. And, and uh, as a nation, we're, we're, we're being judged. I don't know if you sense that. I don't know if you realize that, but this nation is being judged. We're over $20 trillion in debt. The word of God and the word of prophecy has come true that we're being overrun by generations that are new and upcoming that know not the God of our forefathers, that fear not the God of our forefathers. They're going... And they're voting. And they're becoming active in the political system. And the Bible absolutely prophesied that you would be ran over of your youth and led by children without knowledge. That's what the Bible says. That's where we are. The brag of uh, this past election just a little bit over a week ago in and everyone in here will have to test. I've said very, very little politically or about anything of that nature in these last months. Very little. And I'm going to explain why in just a moment. But the boast of the leftist, the liberal side was that the young generation, Generation Z, saved, and this is a polite way of saying what they said, they saved our backsides by getting to the polls and voting. And you know what they were voting for? Free everything. Free love, free sex, free drugs. Free education, free, hand me, give me, I want. They have the heart of prodigals within their chest. And they're far from the foundation and far from the faith and far from the fathers that come over and landed at Plymouth Rock. And if there was ever a nation, I think that biblically mirrors 
the rebellious, adulterous Israel and Judah. It's the United States of America. God has blessed and shed his grace upon this great nation. But I believe we are living presently, presently, right now, under the hand of God's judgment. And I believe that he's removing his protective hand. And darker days are ahead. And you say, Pastor, what can we do? Stand. Having done all in the evil day, stand. Stand on what? Stand on what we just looked at in chapter number one. He said, we didn't look at much. We looked at enough. Thus saith the Lord. And the Lord's word came. We ought to believe what God says. Are we Bible believing? Or is it just a fad and a fashion? Is it really our faith? Do we hold dear these principles? Do we hold dear these precepts? Are they the foundation upon which we build our lives? This first message to backslidden Judah deals with God reminding Israel of the days of blessing and deliverance. Secondly, he reproaches them for forsaking him. Do you know the question that God asks here is really an amazing question in verse number five? And I'd like to reword it just a little bit. Not that I have better wording, but just maybe a different way of saying the same truth. He said, what iniquity have your fathers found in me? In other words, what fault? What failure? What flop have I made? What can you point your finger in my face and say, you've not done this right? God had fed them with manna from heaven and quail, water out of a dry rock. Their shoes didn't wear out. Their clothes didn't wear out. <laughs> pillar cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. The presence of the Shekinah glory of God rested upon the mercy seat that we talked about last Wednesday night. They, they knew that when the cloud lifted and the fire moved, they were to move. I mean, God was with them. God descended down upon them. He was their husband as Christ is the bridegroom of the church. They were unfaithful. And they went after Ashtaroth and Baal and the gods of the Hittites and Jebusites and Amorites and all the ites you can imagine. God said, what have I done? What failure or fault can you find in me that you have walked after vanity? You've went after things that cannot satisfy. You've went after things that cannot sustain you. You've went after things that cannot save you. you you've bowed the knee. And all we're doing that today. Two Republican congressmen, our senators from this state, Today, voted for the Marriage Protection Act. Now, you might think that sounds like a good thing, but it's, it's absolutely horrendous. You say, why? Because it redefines marriage. You say, what's wrong with that? Because they're redefining what God has already defined. Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Word of God. And the Word came near. God's word is very clear throughout the Old Testament, especially in uh, the book of Genesis when it comes to Sodom and Gomorrah. In the book of Leviticus, it's very plain. Romans chapter 1, Paul makes it very plain. But listen, we're not just talking about one form of sexual immorality. Paul identifies all forms of sexual immorality as an affront to God. And I'm going to tell you, you may not like what I'm about to say, but, but the Bible Belt has just about all but turned their back on what God says about sexual purity. They sure have. We've just about turned a blind eye and we have failed to believe what God says about it. 
We think we know better than God and we wonder why our children and our grandchildren don't buy into what we say we believe because we've not walked according to it. We've walked away and that's exactly what Jeremiah has to bring. He has to bring the reproaches that are resting upon them because they have forsaken God. Can I tell you, I'm not sure how that vote turned out today. I didn't have enough time to follow it, but I, but I knew it wasn't going to be good because they were going to have enough Republicans to help pass that bill. Republicans that got elected on conservative family values, traditional family values, they lied. They L-I-E-D, they lied. Look up the definition of politics. Come real close. Listen real carefully. There is no political solution for America. There is no politician that can save America. There is no political party in which you can plant and root down deep and put your faith in because most of them are in it for that big paycheck, that money, that position, and, and most of them become multi, multi millionaires on $170,000 a year. You tell me how that happens. Because they lie still and cheat. On both sides. So, I want to caution you. I want to caution you. I believe Christians ought to vote, and I, I believe they ought to vote their values. But instead of begging people to the polls, we need to be begging people to the pews. Instead of putting our faith and our trust in what greedy politicians say, maybe we ought to start listening to what gospel preachers say. Maybe instead of giving our allegiance to some political platform or political party, we ought to give our allegiance to the Prince of Peace because he is the only answer for what ails the world today. Israel had turned to their neighboring kings and governments, cultural trends. And they had forsaken the commandments and they had forsaken the truth and we, we're, we're in the same path. We're in the same path in the church culture today. Listen, I, I, I've got a confession to make tonight. I really do. I, I've almost got to the point, I said almost, where I don't want to counsel people anymore. I don't want to meet with people in my office. And I can always tell in the first five minutes where that conversation is going. And I can always tell whether or not they're going to take heed to what I'm saying in the first five minutes. Because I hear statements like, but preacher, well, you just don't know. Or doesn't God want me to be happy? They don't want to hear what God says. I'm just honest with you. They don't want to hear what God says about marriage. They don't want to hear what God says about sexual purity. They, they don't want to hear what God has to say about their money and their finances. They think they can rob God and be blessed. You mark her down. There are three reasons that I find that people walk away from solid biblical counseling. Three reasons. 
Number one, they want to be involved in a relationship that God can't bless. Number one. Number two, there's either alcohol and drugs involved in their life and they won't let go of them. Number two. The vast majority, well over 70% of all crimes committed in the United States, all of them involve alcohol. 70% of them involve alcohol and over 80% of them involve either alcohol or drugs. And people don't want to let go of that. People don't want to be delivered from it. They're bound by it. They're bound to it. And number three, they think that what some talk show host has said is more important than what God has said. You say, Pastor, are you serious? I'm serious. Those three reasons. They think Dr. Phil knows more than God. They think Oprah Winfrey is a spiritual leader. And, and I, I'm going to take it a step farther. They, they think that people that wear the cloak of the Christian religion who claim to be evangelicals that are operating in roles that God did not ordain them to be in. And they'd rather listen to that. But, oh, I just love her hair. Oh, I just love her clothes. Oh, she's so witty. That all might be true. But God's word is the same. It's just the same. Now, I've got to the, the point in my ministry where sometimes I, I, I feel like if they're not going to hear what I say behind this pulpit, they're not going to hear what I say behind my desk because I don't have anything different. Why would I give you something different in private than I give you in public? That would make me a hypocrite. That would make me two-faced. That would mean that I'm willing to compromise truth for you, that I'm willing to lie to you. And the truth is today, and this is sort of what, you know, makes me just a little bit squeamish about it. I spent years in postgraduate work preparing myself to counsel, biblically, years. But nowadays, if you hurt someone's feelings, if you cause them emotional distress, they're coming after you and everything you own, and they're coming after your church. And what happened today in the halls of legislature with the Marriage Act is nothing more than an attempt on the liberal end of things to hold liable preachers that preach what thus saith the word of God. That's what it is. Mark her down. We're here. We're where the rubber meets the road. We're here. We're not headed that way. We're here. We've done told God we don't value life. We value our sexual freedom more. We've told God that he didn't know what he was doing when he designed male and female that we know more. Not one nation that has ever followed the pathetic pagan trend that our nation is on has survived without the wrath of God 
are apart from the wrath of God and judgment of God. It's here. You say, well, pastor, that is so discouraging. I come tonight and you're so discouraged. No. Look up. Listen up. Our redemption draws nigh. It's time to stand. It's time to speak. It's time to sow seeds and to do it in love and kind of, I mean, I don't, I don't want to, you can't hate anybody to Jesus. You can't mistreat people. You know what the church is? The church is a place of refuge and rest. But it's also a place of relief and repentance for people who are in sin. For people who need a savior. For people who need shepherding. For people who need those that are willing to speak what thus saith the word of God. Here in this passage that I've read to you, he reminds, he reproaches, and then he thirdly rebukes them for not choosing the true and living God. For going after other impotent gods. Some people, money's their God. Fortune, some people fame. But let me ask you, who has that ever delivered in the hour of death? Queen Victoria said on her deathbed, her words were recorded as this, all my earthly possessions, all of my worldly goods, would I give for just one more moment of life? Muhammad on his deathbed said, I don't know the answers to life. Buddha said, seek for wisdom. What did Jesus say? I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live and never die. Believest thou this? Yea, Lord, we believe. Your brother shall live again. Oh, we know, Lord, he'll live in the... No, I am the resurrection. Where have you laid him? <laughs> That's our Savior. Linda Rayfield resting her head on a pillow of peace tonight. I was with her just moments before I came over here. She's resting her head on a pillow of peace, ready to step out of the temporal <laughs> into endless regions of delight. He said, do you believe that? Oh, I know it. I know it. So what do we do? What do we do when other Christian organizations or entities or universities or colleges or conventions or cliques or camps or whatever you want? What, what, what do we do, pastor? What do we do when the pastors and the prophets and the priests have relented? What do we do? As a local, Bible-believing, New Testament church, this is what we do. We stay with the book. We stay with the blood. <laughs> we stay with the blessed hope. And we live and build out of truth and trust God for the harvest and be faithful unto death. That's what he said. Be thou faithful 
unto death. I'll give thee a crown of life. We've already been crowned with life. We've already been given eternal life. We've already been filled with the presence of Almighty God. We know he's real. Why would we ever step away or go astray? Why? When we have that blessed old Bible, that blessed book of truth, we were begotten out of the scripture. We were born of the spirit. Why would we ever go anywhere else? We need to stay and stand and speak what thus saith the Lord. You say, but what about the consequences? I love what Charles Stanley always says. Obey and trust God with the consequences. I mean, that's one of the best, I mean, that's not in the Bible, but it's got Bible all over it. Just obey and trust God with the, trust God with the consequences. I'll leave you with one more quote and we'll be done for the night because I've went over. Adrian Rogers always said, and I loved Adrian Rogers, a champion, a stalwart of truth, He said, if you don't please the Lord, it doesn't matter who you please. Think about that. If you don't please the Lord, it doesn't matter who you please. And if you please the Lord, it doesn't matter who you don't please. I think that's pretty good, don't you? We'll end on that note tonight. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for your faithful that have come tonight to be reminded that, Lord, we need to stand. We need to speak. Lord, we, we're living in perilous times, dangerous times. Find us faithful unto death. Forgive us for our weakness and our waywardness, the wickedness, Lord, that draws us away Help us, Father, to find our way to the foot of the cross every day and there lay down our lives and surrender to you that we might live Christ. Oh, God, we don't have to despair. We don't have to be discouraged. We don't have to doubt. We delight in your truth. God, bless your people tonight. Prepare us for Sunday. Go with us in these next few days. Bring us back that we might worship you again as we live lives of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.